Okay, gentlemen, good to have you all back here together. Uh, Nicholas, maybe we can just pick off where we left off because I think it's a good jumping off point for our discussion. And I want to ask you about some of the ways that we talk about artificial intelligence in our society. You know, it really ranges from uh, these uh, utopian, very positive images of what, what uh, AI can provide us to these really dark uh, dystopian images. I'm sure some of you have seen Black Mirror. I mean, it's a very scary image of what our future could look like. Why do you think it is, and, and do you think those fears are justified? I think some of the fear is justified. Um, I think that often the, the fear is justified in the wrong places and for the wrong reasons. Right? I think we should be worried about artificial intelligence, but I think we have reason to be worried way before self-aware artificial intelligence like the Terminator movies starts going back in time to kill women in California. Um, I think that we should be worried, for example, um, about the recent controversy about algorithmically determined A-level scores in the United Kingdom or facial recognition programs being developed not just by tech companies but by tech companies for law enforcement purposes. Um, AI is a very broad set of tools and techniques um, and even before we get to artificial general intelligence, I think that there are things we should be concerned about, but they're often very prosaic um, in a way that our science fiction is not. Uh, Florian, you were just you know, nodding your head there, so let's get your take on this. What do you think? So I think um, it's a technology and every technology can do good things and every technology can do bad things. And um, this is a technology which is rather new it is not too well understood yet, and therefore um, people are, of course, over-exaggerating and super, being super excited about its positive things, but they also uh, are in fear of it. And uh, my, my take, actually, we are talking a lot about how AI can solve the autonomous driving problem. Mm -hmm. And I'm convinced it will not solve the autonomous driving problem. Like, um, there is not a single technology which will solve such a huge problem. It's just a part of the puzzle, and it's for sure a very important, very good part, but it's not the only part, so. Jack, do you also see that as part of, a, a part of the puzzle? Yeah, absolutely. I did, you know, AI will be a necessary part. I think, I think Ronak's talk got it really nicely. I mean, Ronak is, is working on developing some extremely yeah. interesting tech that will help with one part of the problem, but he realizes it's only one part of the problem, and as well as helping with that part of the problem, it will also have benefits outside self-driving tech. So, you know, the, the nature of innovation is never quite as neat as the story. Hype, optimism, dystopia, utopia, these are all sort of reflections of a problem ultimately that's one of democracy, which is that we find discussions about technology really disempowering. I think we need to find ways for citizens to get involved in discussing, well, what sort of future do we actually want? And then we don't have to get stuck in this sort of, are you Elon Musk or are you Black Mirror type <laughs> dilemma. Galeon, how do we write rules for socially, democratically responsible AI at a time when maybe in other parts of the world we're seeing uh, you know, leaps and bounds being made in these types of technologies that don't necessarily have the same understanding of what democratic and socially responsible looks like. Yeah, so I think that's a, that's a very important point to understand that uh, AI actually means uh, self-learning systems, cognitive mm -hmm. systems, and that these are systems uh, that in, in the end of the day behave a little bit like a learning child. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and, and as those, uh, as also a learning child, you need to uh, to get into um, th th that you need to challenge once in a while to see whether they are on the right track and have to do the same thing with AI and I think that's the, the very big difference and that's also the, um, the the path through which you can bring in people yeah because if you if you confront or bring together uh, the people's opinions with the capabilities of an AI system and to try to match or try to see whether there is uh, conflict or whether there's agreement. That's also a way of a bit more sophisticated learning then. And I think that, that opportunity is there. But of course, it needs to be taken. And that's the de democratic approach, of course, that we can mm. take. Mm. So it's a question of how to, to deal with that technology and how to, uh, how to openly develop it together with people. Of course, if you wanted to develop it in a, say, like black dark vision or dystopian way, you, you may find such a way as well. Yeah, that, that opportunity is there, like it is with influencing people at some point. 
At this point, I just want to remind everyone that uh, you can send your questions to us using Slido, as we mentioned a little bit earlier. So if you have questions for our panelists on what you're hearing and what they've discussed during their talks, please get on there and send them to us, and we'll make sure that we uh, bring them into the discussion. Um, uh, Nicholas, coming back to you now, can these types of technologies really be shaped to uh, human behavior and also cultural context so that we get somehow uh, locally adapted solutions? That's something we heard from Ronak a little bit earlier. Absolutely. I mean, I think that especially for the kinds of uh, learning systems we have right now, um, as one of my panelists just said, these are, these are more blank slates in some ways than then human beings are blank slates, right? So um, local conditions will necessarily become a part of these algorithms if you give them the opportunity to learn in that way, right? If you send every algorithm, as happened, I believe, again in 2017 with um, the algorithm by the name of Tay that Microsoft designed, if you send every algorithm to Twitter first, you're going to get the same algorithm every time. That's not going to be a fun algorithm because Twitter is not a nice place. <laughs> but um, you know, if you allow different communities to train algorithms, um, either by giving them access to the code for that algorithm and empowering them to use that code, um, or just by investing in the capacities for them to build their own algorithms indigenously, then you're going to have this just as kind of wonderful and varied AI landscape as we have a wonderful and varied human landscape. Um, and just to kind of, you know, so I don't exceed my time, one of the things I think we have to do when we think about utopic visions, and I think that there's value in understanding and believing in utopias, I, I really do, is to make sure that we are not just in investing our, our mental energies in the same sets of utopias or dystopias over and over again. Um, to note the unfortunate demise of uh, Mr. Chadwick Boseman recently, the star mm -hmm. of Black Panther, right? There is now a well-developed Af Afrofuturist, there is a well-developed Chinese uh, technological utopic literature system. Um, and we have an opportunity not just to kind of think broadly about AI, but also think broadly about the utopias we care about. I'll ask all of you to pick up on that. Jack, starting with you, where do you see the opportunity here? The, so the opportunity for self-driving cars specifically? The opportunity there to create new visions, as, as Nicholas was just touching upon, new visions of what those utopias and sometimes dystopias might look like. Yeah, well, I think, I think so I, I would see new technologies are a great way to start new conversations in the mm -hmm. same way as actually uh, the crises that we were talking about earlier are also a way to start new conversations. That doesn't mean that we should let new technologies define those conversations. So let's try to think about this as a sort of act of, of, of collective imagining. What would we like our transport to look like? The danger here, the real danger, is that we sleepwalk into new te technological futures. We make unconscious decisions about mobility, as lots of cities did about uh, the motor car, which meant that they created forms of car dependency. Mm. And that's a form of sort of somnambulance that we need to avoid if we're going to do things better this time. What do you think, Florian? Um, yeah, I mean, um, I, I um, see that this... Um, so so my, my take is um, basically the following. My take is that um, mobility is somewhat a distributed problem. So hmm. the... We are always seeing it from a local perspective. We are sitting in the car and not only seeing basically the stuff around us, but basically to, the, the mobility has to be seen as a really distributed pro problem from all the parts. So if I do a local action here, basically, I'll influence what happens basically a kilometer behind me or a kilometer um, you know, to the side where I just came from. So this local perspective is something which I think is, is something which is, um, which is just there, but um, technology here has the chance to change that. So tele technology will give the chance that I also see what is happen happening around me, basically, for example, in routing, where uh, I get a new route, where to go, uh, and I haven't been there, or I'm not there, but I'm still seeing how the traffic is there and uh, how the traffic will be there once I am there. Technology with a conversation surrounding it, right, Galeana? A conversation of how we shape it. Yeah, I, actually, I think there's, there's also hope, yeah? Mm. And I... I 
particularly see that with uh, with intelligent technologies, uh, and I see the the opportunity of getting people involved in the development. And I believe there's this one big takeaway from the or take from the from the COVID-19 crisis that uh, all of a sudden we are uh, we are we are forced in a sense uh, to develop human-centered mobility because human demands and human wishes and feelings about mobility are changing that rapidly and that radically uh, th that nobody can ignore that anymore, right? So best example, I believe, here in Berlin is uh, the, th these pop-up uh, bike lanes that, yeah. that they were created on, uh, on the bigger roads in the city. Uh, all of a sudden, would things that have been discussed for ages, whether there could be more space for cyclists in the city, that can happen. Because it's just touching all of us to, and, and, and forcing all of us to change behaviors, and thereby human-centered mobility can become reality. Even so, that's not very intelligent so far. Right. I would say, see, th there's lots of opportunities of developing other fields of technology of controlled, remotely controlled uh, services, whether that's transport or energy or health or so, uh, that can be highly influenced by yeah, the perspective and needs of people. And I, th I see that as, as a great opportunity. Jack, in your presentation, you took us through some historical images and some visions that people had at the time of, of their future. Is there, are there technological developments we've seen in the last, let's say, 20 years or so that inform how you look at precisely that conversation that you said we need to have going forward? I mean, Nicholas mentioned Twitter being a pretty ugly place, and it is. Uh, mm. But is there something that you looked at that you said, okay, that's been done right, and this we need to do better? Yeah, great question. So there are... There are better and worse approaches to the development of, of, of new technologies. There are, but so my commitment is, is towards a more dem democratic, open conversation about, about new technologies. And there I point to um, a lot of developments in biomedicine where technologies were opened up to the sorts of ethical thinking that you know, Nicholas and I would regard as, as particularly important. They were opened up at an early stage, which meant that you know, potentially radically disruptive technologies like in vitro fertilization, test tube babies, right, were introduced in quite a thoughtful, responsible way when it came to an alternative biotechnology, genetically modified crops in Europe, as we know, you know, that was handled extremely badly. The benefits were assumed and it created a crisis mm. um, of, of public resistance. And I think if we look at the technologies around around mobility as a technology as potentially disruptive and controversial as a, a self-driving car, we do need to manage it really carefully. If we let technology developers, you know, if we leave them to their own devices, it will not end well. Nicholas, do you agree? I just I think you shook your head. I can't I can't exactly tell, but do you agree that if we leave them to their own devices, it won't end well? Uh, Australians say yes and no and actually mean totally different things, I think, to the rest <laughs> of the world. Why. So okay. that's a, um, yeah, nah is an appropriate phrase in my country. Um, but no, I, I really like what Jack is saying. And I think that one of the really important things about self-driving cars is we know that there is already significant resistance to the idea of the robot driving me or however, you know, a survey uh, company creates these questions. And one of the things I think it's really important to remember is that this is not necessarily a if you build it, they will come kind of situation, right? Um, people, mobility is essential to their lives, right? I mean, in, in the country in which I live, um, where you live determines what kind of healthcare you have access to. Um, your your postcode is more determinative of your health outcomes than your genetics are. Um, and so your ability to move around is absolutely fundamental to your life. And if self-driving cars are not created in a way that actually makes people's lives better, I think that we could see not just real resistance to them, but out and out rebellion to them. And I think that would be justified. And in terms of you know democratic engagement, there are people who are deeply worried about road fatalities, right? There are people who, um, you know, have to drive long distance for work and put themselves at risk every day to, to do that. And so there is a community who wants better mobility, but the challenge is to actually meet those people where they are and get from them uh, 
both what they need and then what they require for that need to be met in a way that they can endorse. And we don't do a lot of that on a broad scale with technologies, at least not in, in this country, um, although I think that you know, um, the recent work by the UK on mitochondrial replacement therapy is a really great example of where there was a public deliberation, there was expert recommendations, and those two things interacted in a way that was really productive. Um, contrary to, for example, the GM crops uh, debate or the use of um, GM mosquitoes down in the Florida Keys um, as part of kind of uh, agricultural experiments that's going on right now. Okay, well, last question from me before we get some questions in from, from Slido. And Gillian, it's, it's for you. We heard about uh, having this conversation about making sure that there's inc inclusivity with new technologies. Do you think autonomous vehicles and AI can actually also generate social benefits? I mean, on one of your slides, you had all those different factors of yeah. legal, of economic, yeah. of all these consequences. Yeah. Uh, y yes and no. Um, first of all, I mean, for, for it, in terms of mobility, we're all experts, and, and we, we all have our experiences with it, and we, we do know that sometimes if systems are a little bit more flexible, a little bit more adapted, uh, that would be far more convenient, and we sometimes are making those experiences and say, hi, that's really a great advantage that, that, that technology can deliver. Um, there's a, a big learning, an important learning that we um, had with, uh, with people with special needs and, and, and the elderly. Um, on the one hand, uh, autonomous technologies, automated technologies can be a, a big help, of course, and, and uh, many are really expecting some great assist, uh, assistance from it, keeping mobility even at an elder age or uh, even uh, w with, with limited uh, capabilities of like walking or whatever. But on the other hand, we also learned that um, sometimes the needs are very specific and the needs are very, uh, yeah, very individual. And there's still a human help is needed, a human support is needed. And I think this is a bit of the balance we have, right? So on the one hand, we can it, uh, consider our hope for, for big changes and big developments in terms of social justice and inclusiveness, but also we need to be aware of the limitations of that. And th this is particularly the case uh, for, for handicapped people, for example. Okay, well, I, I'm going to bring in one question here from Slido that we've received, and I'm going to ask you all to answer it, and we'll make it relatively quick before we run out of time, and we'll go around the round, starting with you, Florian. The question is, what is missing for passenger AV to be brought to the road? So let's say top two uh, elements there, and how far are we from there? So, of course, I have to say sensors are missing. <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> the, done. <laughs> the perception is, for me, the crucial thing. I yeah. think that is, that, that is also what we see mm -hmm. in the difference between America and, and, and the Germans. Germans are a bit perceived as being slow. I don't think they are slow. Mm -hmm. I think they are more careful, <laughs> making sure that nobody, that we are not endangering people. And what there has to be is, I mean, you have to put, uh, support. It's always innovation, actually. The big, the question was before, why are, uh, um, uh, well, are OEMs in tier ones not leading anymore? Actually, no, they are not because of it's about innovation. You need to come up with new technologies, and that's something startups do. And actually, OEMs in tier ones know uh, that fact. So supporting new uh, st startups, new innovation, I think that's a thing where especially Europe has to catch up and, and do more. OK, Jack, you're up. So what's missing? Well, yeah, I so, mean... so what's missing, and how far are we from there? Um, so as I said in my talk, I think how, how far are we, when is the wrong question, the right question is where. Um, when, when somebody says, you know, why can't we have driverless transport, my response as a Londoner is to say we've had driverless transport for decades. The Docklands Light Railway doesn't have drivers, the Victoria Line Underground Line doesn't have drivers. Why don't they have drivers? Because they're designed as whole systems. So in terms of what's missing in order to get driverless transport, we could have it in certain places, the question is, you know, what's missing for it to happen everywhere? And that's an impossibly hard question. So I think we need to have a much more granular discussion about the conditions under which driverless transport actually works. And then we have a discussion about infrastructures. We have a discussion about behaviours. Who's allowed on the road? Are pedestrians allowed to mingle with traffic? And then that becomes much more complicated. Nicholas, your take. For me, I think the two big things at the highest possible level are the 
the political vision for a mobility system that includes but is not limited to autonomous vehicles uh, as they are typically described. Um, and I think the second thing is the conception of uh, mobility and transportation as a, as a public good that needs to be invested in, uh, just like modern nations invest in healthcare, in education, um, without uh, particular regard for cost, because they are things that citizens deserve and need to have. And last but certainly not least, Gillian. Well, there's something I think we have not yet mentioned in this context, and that is we are in the midst of a, an economic crisis as well, yeah. not just a, a health crisis. And uh, we should be aware of the fact that companies developing these technologies, whether they are startups or big companies, um, th they also need the fr to have the freedom for that, and they have research innovation departments for that. And uh, particularly for them, it's really hard to defend those topics at these times. Okay, economic crisis. Certainly, we have to remember that. Thank you, gentlemen, for a fascinating discussion. Really great to have you. If we can get a round of applause for this really interesting look into this topic. Thank you.